All right. Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And today we're continuing in our study of the book, More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell. And uh, this is part five. If you haven't seen the previous four studies, um, uh, they are uh, available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So I hope you will go back and watch it all from the beginning. But right now, we'll pick up where we left off in the book. Uh, I have with me here on the telephone, on speakerphone, listening along, Brother Ted. His YouTube channel is God's Truth Ministries. So I hope you will subscribe to his channel. And also here uh, on the online, I have uh, Brother Joe. And I'll ask Brother Joe to say hi, introduce himself to everybody before we get going here. Yeah, this is Joe from the uh, Sebastian Dresden channel, and uh, looking forward to uh, starting, uh, I think we're closing in on chapter five here, so uh, looking forward to it, Luke. Okay. Uh, see. All right, I'm picking up here, if you happen to have this little paperback book, I'm picking up where I left off last time. It's on page 43, and it says, A. H. McNeil, former Regis Professor of Divinity at the University of Dublin, challenges form critics' concept of oral tradition. He points out that the form critics, uh, by the way, that's, I guess that's a name of a, a, either a particular way of thinking or, or maybe a actual group of people that are call themselves form critics as a, as a group. But um, uh, it says, he points out that form critics do not deal with the tradition of Jesus' words as closely as they should. A careful look at 1 Corinthians 7, 10, 12, and 25 shows the careful preservation and existence of a genuine tradition of recording these words. In the Jewish religion, it is customary for a student to memorize a rabbi's teaching. A good pupil was like, quote, a plastered cistern that loses not a drop, unquote. If we rely on C.F. Burney's theory in his book, The Poetry of Our Lord, written in 1925, we can assume that much of the Lord's teaching is in Aramaic poetical form, making it easy to be memorized. Hmm, that's really very interesting. Brother Joe, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know. Uh, I think the forum uh, critics there is, is uh, these professors who uh, put a great deal of, of emphasis on being published and having uh, recognition in, uh, in their uh, in various industry periodicals and stuff and uh, like medical news and, and uh, science news journals. Uh, it's largely back padding and, and they don't have a lot of uh, contrary uh, uh, voices. So, but I don't have many thoughts at this point. I'm still gearing up here. All right. Well, uh, I, you know, I read this book so many years ago that you know, it's much of it is like, uh, it's almost like reading it the first time again, refreshing my memory. But um, I didn't recall that they considered his uh, words, uh, the words of Jesus, to be um, in the style of Aramaic poetry. That was that's very interesting to me but um, let me connect this uh, session with the end of the last one and, and we we just were established in the last uh, uh, study that uh, these form critics and I guess many people at that at that time had previously believed that the New Testament books were pinned uh, around the end of the second century. And, and then of course, we established um, in the last session that 
no, now, now, now the, the uniform opinion, universal opinion of everybody, we, it's all agreed upon that the New Testament books were all written uh, in roughly between, say, 40 AD to 90 AD. Uh, some even say, let's say from, I believe the, the, the number was uh, like uh, between 45 and 75 AD, roughly. So, it, but it seems to me obvious that if we were to believe that the writers of these books were Matthew, who was a contemporary of Jesus, was an apostle, Mark, who was a young man who was uh, basically his book, many people consider that to be uh, the Gospel of Peter, because Mark was like the the helper and companion and disciple of Peter. And so we don't have a gospel of Peter, but the gospel of Mark uh, basically would, could be considered Peter's gospel because uh, Mark would be have written down the account as Peter had taught him. Um, then we've got Luke, who was a companion to Paul, and Luke's gospel is often considered to be the gospel of Paul because uh, Luke was uh, with Paul during most or much of his uh, uh, ministry. And he gave this, not only wrote the, the gospel of Luke, which much of it is because of his own eyewitness testimony and also because of writing down the, uh, uh, what Paul had said. But he, Luke also was the one that wrote the book of Acts which is, should be called the, the Acts of the Apostles. So it's a historical record. The book of Acts is a historical account of the beginnings of the church, uh, beginning with the ascension of Jesus, and then the apostles are left to establish the church. And so the book of Acts is a historical account of the beginnings of the church and the Acts of the, the Apostles. And then John, the Gospel of John was written by the Apostle John, who also was a, a contemporary and eyewitness a, a, a apostle of Jesus. Um, and so close, he was commonly referred to as the beloved apostle. And uh, he wrote uh, the, the Gospel of John and a couple of epistles that are actually letters. Um, and that's, I believe that there's First John, Second John, I can't remember if there's a third John, but uh, I, I think there's first, second, third John. And then he also wrote the book of Revelation. Um, but the point I'm trying to make here is that if we believe that these people are actually the authors of these books, they had to write, have written them when they were alive. <laughs> and if they wrote them while they're alive, then, then it's impossible for them to be append at the uh, end of the second century, they they all uh, they are all succumbed uh, sometime before the end of the first century. So to me, it's a no brainer to think that the uh, the datings for the New Pest New Testament uh, books uh, they all had to be penned and dated somewhere in the first century. And uh, it's my opinion. I do agree that it's probably been around between forty A.D. and uh, uh, 70 AD. I, I tend to lean towards the, the book of Revelation and John to be written before the, uh, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Otherwise, it seems to me that if the temple had been destroyed, that uh, John would have included that in his writings. But um, so that's kind of my, I'm trying to connect what we did at the end of the last study to this study. But so brother, uh, what, do you, what do you have to say about all that? Well, simply this, that uh, the uh, apostles uh, in Scripture uh, are all well documented outside of Scripture. Uh, it's not like uh, we can't find record of Saul of Tarsus anywhere except Scripture. And the same would go for, for uh, I think, most of the apostles. Uh, Josephus, uh, one generation removed, uh, from from their era, uh, had firsthand uh, contact with uh, contemporaries of Christ and the apostles, 
and people that were very young uh, at the time, but, but contemporaries and eyewitnesses. And uh, he was able to establish uh, the deaths of, of uh, some of the apostles from firsthand account. That's how we know Peter was crucified upside down and his statements at the time of that uh, happening and uh, the, the conclusion of, of Paul's life and, and so on. And it's not just Josephus, but he's the, the recognized historian uh, that didn't have an ax to grind. Uh, he was, <clears throat> I don't believe he was a Christian. I, I believe he was a Jew retained by, by uh, Rome uh, to record the antiquities of the Jews. And so he did so uh, very methodically and with great detail. And so we have a historical account of, of the apostles, their time periods, and their personhood from first-hand accounts by a, a recognized uh, historian who was not uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, prove or disprove Christianity in any way. Most of his most of his work uh, was on things of, of uh, earlier dates than Christ. You know, the wars and whatnot that Israel had gone through but it also included uh, the contemporaries one generation back. So pretty powerful evidence. Well, I, uh, I, I think everything you said is correct, but I, uh, if I understood you correctly, um, I, I would disagree if you think that uh, Josephus was a next generation. He was a contemporary uh, be, because he was, he was employed by, and in fact, he, uh, he was considered to be a traitorous in, in that he aligned himself with the emperor uh, Rome uh, rather uh, and he wrote a detailed uh, historical account as an eyewitness of the siege of Jerusalem that was uh, about a, a, a three-year uh, <clears throat> war as they uh, they were um, laying siege to Jerusalem, destroying Jerusalem, and finally they destroyed the temple. And uh, Titus, who was later to become the, the emperor, he, he was the, the, the general that uh, did that. And uh, Josephus recorded it in great detail. And the, the preterist viewpoint of eschatology, they rely heavily, heavily on Josephus's writings of that time. And they <clears throat> they're convinced that um, the um, the account in Matthew of uh, that many people today attribute to a future time they attribute it to this uh, three and a half year period and they say they can lay Josephus's writings about this siege uh, and uh, this destruction of Jerusalem and the temple they can they can lay his writings right over the the writings of uh, in Matthew that Jesus described these things that were going to happen and Jesus said that these things will all happen uh, uh, some of you here right now will witness it and and he also used the term uh, this generation shall not pass a lot of people want to say think that this generation applies to some future generation that's going to witness it but the, the preterist viewpoint and to me the logical uh, is let's assume that Jesus is talking uh, you know, speaking correctly, that the generation he's talking to right then would would witness all these things. <clears throat> if that's the case, then, uh, well, as I said, Josephus uh, is a, you know, a respected, uh, one of the most respected historians of the time, and he did record all of that as, a, as an eyewitness. All right, before I go on, any thoughts, Brother Joe? Brother, yeah, yeah. Brother yeah. Ted's going to speak up whenever he feels he wants to. I'm not going to call on him, but if if any time he wants to say, then just go ahead and interrupt us, brother Joe. You are you are correct about the the siege of uh, Jerusalem at seventy A.D. But we have to remember that was thirty five years uh, after uh, uh, the death of Christ, and he was also uh, privy to uh, first hand accounts from others. He he didn't he didn't uh, necessarily meet each of the apostles but he did have contact with those who did. And uh, so how much of his uh, histories are firsthand account? I know, like you said, the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, he was, but uh, whether or not it's, it's very, very good 
and unbiased history. Back to you, Luke. Okay, um, I'll continue reading. It says, uh, Paul M. Mayer, professor of ancient history at Western Michigan University, writes, quote, uh, arguments that Christianity hatched its Easter myth over a lengthy period of time or that the sources were written many years after the event are simply not factual, unquote. Analyzing form criticism, Albright wrote, quote, only modern scholars who lack both historical method and perspective can spin such a web of speculation as that which uh, form critics have surrounded the gospel tradition, unquote. Albright's own conclusion was that a period of 20 to 50 years is too slight to permit uh, of any appreciable corruption of the essential content and even of the specific wording of the sayings of Jesus, unquote. Brother Joe? Yeah, um, it just brings to mind uh, pro or uh, against uh, common sense. The, the uh, scientific community and the philosophical community and the political community that would seek to denigrate the historicity of the Bible often use a lot of technical terms and flowery speech to uh, change what would be common sense into something that is suddenly esoteric and uh and and they just they create an air of distrust and uh uh disbelief just through flowery language and and uh and compelling language and luckily we have a few on our side that uh are able to match them in their scientific and, and uh, influential terminology to justify uh, common sense. It just, if you read Nietzsche and, and Hitchens and all these guys, uh, it's just amazing how they can influence people with language. And uh, I would even submit language as a, as a proof of, uh, of intelligent design. It's not, it, it's innate, it's not, it's not, uh, something that uh, just happens upon us through uh, learning. But uh, maybe I'm going off too far in left field. Back to you, Luke. No, I, I don't think you are. Matter, matter of fact, I, I want you to have uh, freedom to get off track whenever you feel like it. It's okay, because I'm sure whatever it is, it'll be of interest to me and to everybody else. Um, I'll continue reading. <clears throat> Often when I am talking with someone about the Bible, they sarcastically reply that you can't trust what the Bible says, uh, why it was written almost 2,000 years ago. It's full of errors and discrepancies. I reply that I believe I can trust the scriptures. Then I describe an incident that took place during a lecture in a history class. I made the statement that I believed there was more evidence for the reliability of the New Testament than for almost any 10 pieces of classical literature put together. The professor sat over uh, in the corner snickering as if to say, quote, oh, gee, come on, unquote. I said, what are you snickering about? Uh, he said the, the audacity to make the statement in a history class that the New Testament is reliable, that's ridiculous. Well, I appreciate uh, it when somebody makes a statement like that because I always like to ask this one question. I, I've never had a positive response, by the way. I said, tell me, sir, as a historian, what are the tests that you apply to any piece of literature of history to determine if it's accurate or reliable. The amazing thing was he didn't have any tests. I answered, I have some tests. I believe that the historical reliability of the scripture should be tested by the same criteria 
that all historical documents are tested by. Military historian C. Sanders lists and explains the three basic principles of histor historiography. They are the, bi the bibliographical test, the internal evidence test, and the external evidence test. And we're going to go into detail on each of these as, uh, as we go forward here. <laughs> but what, what's your thoughts on that conversation with him and the professor? Uh, you know, there's something that, that he didn't say here that I find horribly amusing. One of the big things that you'll have atheists, agnostics, and non-believers of every stripe, they say the same thing every time. <clears throat> How can you trust a book that is recognized as being written 2,000 years ago, speaking of the New Testament. And it was written 2,000 years ago, invalidates its foundational truth. I just want someone to turn around, look at them, and say, the fact that it was written 2,000 years ago is proof that is historically valid and foundational. No one denies that it was written 2,000 years ago, and it goes to prove itself, not to disprove anything. <laughs> it's just, they're using an argument that can easily be turned to hopefully open their eyes to see the fact that the fact it was written 2,000 years ago is a proof, not a, not a uh, reason to doubt. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, uh, the uh, I woke up this morning, and, and for some reason, I, I know this was not part of my dreams. I I, I dream all night long. I'm, every night when I go to sleep, it's feel I feel like I I'm I'm going to go to the movies. I, it's just like my dreams are just continuous and interesting. Of course, I can't remember them when I wake up, <laughs> but but I, today I woke up. And for some reason, the word supercilious came to my mind. And I, I, I wasn't sure what it meant. I'd heard it. Uh, and I, I thought that it was maybe some kind of an adjective to, to describing a, a, a type of personality. And I asked my wife uh, what, what it means. She gets very amused by me sometimes that some of the things I, I come up with. She said, how do you come up with this stuff? Why do you ask me all these things? Why do you think of such things? <laughs> but she she gave me a definition of it, and I and I thought, I don't, that doesn't sound right. So we looked it up, and it, it's basically arrogant, uh, uh, disdainful type of uh, attitude. Uh, but um, that's, uh, I think this is the kind of attitude that were, were pompous that that uh, a lot of these people have that you, you think that someone who is a professor of history or even a professor of anything it seemed like it seemed like they would uh, if, even if they consider themselves to be liberal in the, in the studying of liberal arts or they have a liberal attitude where they want to have a lot of uh, freedom freedom of expression and ideas and the university is supposed to be a place where it's a laboratory to, to discuss all kinds of ideas. And, and yet, the most typical attitude is this supercilious, pompous attitude that they've got the answers and that something like the Bible they just mock at. They, their mind is so closed and already made up, even though, and they haven't even really studied it as we are doing today. Uh, uh, and, and actually looking at, okay, is there anything really to support the Bible that should give us confidence that it is reliable, and historical, and scientific, and uh, they, they, they don't even take, make the effort to even look at another side of the argument. I found this also to be true uh, on the subject of evolution, Darwinian evolution, is that my entire life, I remember from the seventh grade, my, I think it was the first time in a science book that I saw the term evolution and then they were discussing, and it was called the theory of evolution. And then the eighth grade, 
of course, every year I had to take another science class. Each one's year is supposed to be more advanced, I guess, but uh, there again, the subject of evolution, but it's called a theory. And as I go through junior high and high school and, and college and all these time continuing to study this evolution, I noticed that at some point they stopped calling it the theory of evolution, just referred to as evolution. And instead of even thinking of it in terms of this theoretical, it was, it was taught as a fact. And, and so I, my entire life, you know, I, I've been taught year after year after year about evolution. Um, and I just believed it because that's what I was taught. And then after I became a Christian at a Christian bookstore, I'm perusing through there, I, I saw some books that uh, were arguments against evolution. So I started reading those books and I, for the first time in my life, I actually saw that, wait a second, there are uh, scientific and, and uh, uh, you know, many, many different arguments against Darwinism. And once I saw them, I realized, wait a second, this, what I've been taught is actually absurd and ridiculous and impossible. But, because, but I was never exposed to the other side of the argument. And it's the same thing about the accuracy, historicity, the reliability of the Bible. Uh, we, most people are never exposed to, the, to our side of the argument that, hey, there is evidence to support it, but most people, they're only getting their side of it. And this is one of the things that I will boast in uh, and that I'm, I will say I'm very happy in my life. I've learned, even on all subjects of theology, even if I hold a position, I'm willing to listen and study the other side of it. And sometimes, because I'm willing to look at the other side of the argument, uh, they win me over. Sometimes they don't. But there's a saying, you, uh, remember why, why we debate. The, the only thing we have to lose are the errors we hold. Who but a stubborn fool would hold on to their errors once they've been exposed? And that's a healthy attitude to have. And, but this professor here is just supercilious, and he just has this condescending attitude. His mind's made up, but he doesn't even know what the tests are. As, as uh, Josh Bell says in the book, he says, well, what are the tests? And he doesn't even know how to test it to see see if something is historically reliable. I'm sorry, I know I know I went on and on, but what's your what's your thoughts on all that? Oh, I, I am so glad you went on and on uh, because I love that word. Now I didn't have a chance, or I try. I decided not to take the chance and open another window. I'm uh, about six feet from my computer, so I have to move back and forth to do anything. But uh, I, I, I super silious is a word that really fits. And this is by memory, so I didn't look it up, but uh, silius is a, is a Latin form of foolishness, and super means a, a surface or a veneer. And so what you have in my own interpretation here is a veneer giving the impression of depth. And man, if that does not, is that, is that not the perfect word to, to describe uh, ivory tower evolution and Darwinism. It, it's a veneer that's giving an impression of depth. And there's nothing but surface matter. There's nothing uh, to the theory to prove the theory. As a matter of fact, as we discussed yesterday, while the Bible gets proven more and more as years go by, uh, evolution and, or Darwinism uh, is, is disproven more and more. And yet the veneer remains tight. You can't see through the veneer, or at least people can't, because what do people look at? The surface, super cilious. The surface uh, and, and the Latin root, a foolish assertion. So what a, the dream was prophetic, perfect for today's uh, discussion. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, all right, so he says there are these three tests. The first one we're going to look at is bio biographical test. <clears throat> the biographical test is an examination of the textual transmission by which documents reach us. In other words, not having the original documents, how reliable are the copies we have in regard to the number of manuscripts <clears throat> and this is the official way that they 
terminology that they use is it's referred to as MSS. So that when you, if you see MSS, it's referring to the the number of manuscripts, <clears throat> and uh, and the time interval between the original and the extant copy. Um, now we can appreciate the tremendous wealth of manuscript authority of the New Testament by comparing it with textual material from other notable ancient sources. The history of <laughs> Thucydides, oh boy, I've never heard of this character before. It's spelled T-H-U-C-Y-D-I-D-E-S, living uh, from 460 to 400 BC. So the history of Thucydides is available to us from just eight MSS dated uh, uh, about 8,900, almost 1,300 years after he wrote. The MSS of the history of Herod Herodotus, now there's a name I remember, the history MSS, I mean the MSS of the history of Herodotus are likewise late and scarce. And yet, as F.F. F. Bruce concludes, quote, no classical scholar would listen to an argument that the authenticity of Herodotus or Thucydides is in doubt because the earliest manuscripts of their works, which are of use to us, are over 1,300 years later than the originals. Uh, there's much more to be said about this, but let me pause there for your thoughts. Well, I, I'm not going to pretend that I followed all of that. Uh, I've got my Kindle edition here, and I was trying to find out where you were at. I was having just a little bit of trouble following it. But, but what I will say is that uh, one thing the, the scriptures have uh, over most any other text, uh, or at least ancient text for sure, is that uh, scribes, Pharisees, and, and people schooled in the Jewish tradition or the Hebrew tradition were the ones who uh, recorded uh, the scriptures. And there's a recognized uh, uh, discipline that's not known anywhere else in the world. I mean, there's there's some good Chinese manuscripts and some, some various uh, uh, cultural manuscripts that were very carefully transcribed, but uh, nothing compares to the training of, of a Jewish scribe and uh, so it's culturally uh, innate within the Jewish culture to uh, uh, be very, very intricate and detailed in every dot and tittle. So uh, the Bible certainly has that going for it. Okay, well, uh, for, for your benefit and anybody who may be, uh, want to follow along in this video with their own copy of this book, more than a carpenter by Josh McDowell, a paperback that's 128 pages is all. Right now, I'm in the middle of chapter four. Uh, in this book is page 47, and it has a subtitle in this portion. Can you read that? Can you read that? It says, uh, Bio Biographical Test is the subtitle of this portion I'm on now. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know if in the Kindle, if, it, if it'll appear in the same way. Uh, so let me continue on. It says, Aristotle wrote his uh, uh, poetics around 343 BC. And yet the earliest copy we have is dated AD 1100, nearly 1400 year gap. And only five MSS are in existence. Caesar composed his history of the Gaelic Wars between 58 and 50 BC, and its manuscript authority rests on nine or 10 copies dating a thousand years after his death. So what we're, we're seeing here is that uh, some of the most re respected historical accounts of his history uh, the the uh, the written record of it 
there are very few copies in existence and they are uh, you know hundreds or even more than a thousand years the copy that exists is separated from that amount of time from the original events and writings and yet people don't question their uh, reliability uh, well there's a lot much more to be said on this but let me let you speak there well it's just amazing it's just amazing uh, the you know in in college uh, we spent a whole lot of time on on a lot of these uh, early manuscripts and even in our era Luke uh, the Bible was just you know largely uh, secondary uh, to the study in, in uh, ancient literature I mean it was certainly had its chapter but uh, uh, more so did uh, Socrates Aristotle and the early uh, Greek philosophers so uh, and the, the the myths you know mythology is central to uh, uh, history and, and literature in any college and again uh, biblical text is relegated to uh, second fiddle and so it's amazing to me when when you realize through this book and I had I really had no idea I'd forgotten how little uh, uh, original text is available and how little secondary text is available a thousand years later you know and uh, it's just amazing to me that, that the Bible and scripture is not given so much more weight than that you know we American universities were founded on, on the Bible rightly so now it seems as though uh, again the Bible's second fiddle to Greek mythology and and these other writings by Aristotle and such that you've been discussing uh, with not even not even a, a, a slight bit of comparison to authenticity in the scripture. Well, I think that uh, some of this um, problem may be intentional, but I, I think probably for the most part, I'm just guessing, but I, I think that for the most part, um, even these so-called you know educated people that are authorities on history they they're ignorant they're not even aware of this basic these basic facts that uh, as we're going to prove here that the the bible had the copies that we have available uh, are a thousand times more uh, prevalent and and uh that the distance of time from the originals to the copies is is minuscule compared to the other thing, the historical uh, writings that people trust automatically. It's, uh, but how many people even know that? Uh, hopefully this, this little book here and this study that we're doing here, maybe more people will become aware of this, but uh, the vast majority of people are totally unfamiliar with this. Well, they gotta, they gotta uh, get a little notation on their, on their degrees when they hit graduate school that have your word there only written in, uh, uh, with hyphens, super silly us. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> that is right. Let's let's uh, if you if you do separate it, it really is uh, descriptive of them, isn't it? Okay. Uh, now, when it comes to the manuscript authority of the New Testament, the abundance of material is almost embarrassing. In contrast, oh, Brother Bill should be here. This is his favorite way of expressing something. It's almost embarrassing. <laughs> um, after the early papyri manuscript discoveries that bridged the gap between the times of Christ and the second century, an abundance of other MSS came to light. Over 20,000 copies of New Testament manuscripts are in existence today. The Iliad has 643 MSS and is second in manuscript authority after the New Testament. We're going to, much more to be said on this, but let's just pause there because that's so, so profound. Let me read this again and get your reaction. Over 20,000 copies of New Testament manuscripts are in existence today. The Iliad has 643 MS and is second in manuscript authority after the New Testament. Well, that, that's just mind-blowing. I mean, really. 
I, I, I knew it was, I, I knew that it was something like that, but hearing it read again by someone who's uh, done the study and, and, and counted uh, uh, particulars, that's just amazing to me. The Iliad's held up as the, the most reputable historical document known to mankind. And uh, it's not even in the same ballpark as scripture, uh, the New Testament anyway. And so, you know, those, those uh, 20,000 copies you're talking about, Luke, I, I want to add that it wasn't like they found a room with 20,000 copies. We're talking a vast amount of sources, uh, uh, a vast amount of locations, a vast amount of, uh, of scribes and uh, copiers, and uh, all put together, brought into the same room and compared. And with the exception of dots, tittles, and transliteration uh, changes, uh, the meanings and the vast majority are identical. It, that's amazing. Amen. Powerful, powerful uh, truth and, and evidence of uh, why we trust this uh, Word of God, this, the Bible. Uh, Sir Frederick Kenyon, who was the director and principal librarian at the British Museum, and second to none in authority in issuing statements about manuscripts, concludes, quote, the interval then between the dates of original composition and the earliest extant evidence becomes so small as to be in fact negligible. And the last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to us substantially as they were written has now been removed. Both the authenticity and the general integrity of the books of the New Testament may be regarded as finally established." Unquote. The New Testament Greek scholar J. Harold Greenlee adds, quote, since scholars accept generally trustworthy the writings of the ancient classics, even though the earliest MSS were written so long after the original writings, and the number of extant MSS is in many instances so small, it is clear that the reliability of the New Testament is likewise assured." Unquote. The application of the bibliographical uh, test to the New Testament assures us that it has more manuscript authority than any piece of literature from antiquity. Adding to that authority, the more than 100 years of intensive New Testament textual criticism. One can conclude that an authentic New Testament text has been established. Thank you, Jesus. Brother Joe? Well, <clears throat> I, I, I uh, am searching my memory again, and it seems to me that we were given, a everybody studied Homer, uh, I mean, in great detail, uh, the Iliad or the Odyssey, whatever you want to call it, was was a primary text in all uh, uh, ancient literature courses, and still is, I'm sure. And and uh, just to see the comparison that McDowell has made here is is truly mind blowing. It really is, uh, especially since you know. Uh, uh, the, the Odyssey was basically poems about the Trojan Wars, and and uh, and and the primary source of our information about the tra Trojan Wars, if not exclusive, I'm not sure about that. But uh, how much attention we pay to it, and how little attention to Holy Writ, is, is just mind-boggling. Okay, well, go to his second test. It's internal evidence test. The bibliographical test has determined uh, only that the text we have now is what was originally recorded. One has still to determine whether that written record is credible and to what extent. The, uh, that is the problem of internal criticism, which is the second test of historicity listed by C. Sanders. And that's not Colonel Sanders. At this point, 
the literary critic still follows Aristotle's dictum, quote, the benefit of the doubt is to be given to the document itself and not arrogated by the critic to himself, unquote. In other words, as John W. Montgomery summarizes, quote, one must listen to the claims of the document under analysis and not assume fraud or error unless the author disqualified himself by contradictions or known factual inaccuracies, unquote. Dr. Lewis Gottschalk, former professor of history at the University of Chicago, outlines his historical method in a uh, guide used by many uh, for the historical investigation. Gottschalk points out that the ability of the writer or the witness to tell the truth is helpful to the historian to determine credibility. Quote, even if it is contained in a document obtained by force or fraud or is otherwise impeachable or is based on hearsay evidence or is from an interested witness. I'm not sure I follow that, uh, so I'll, I'll keep reading. The, quote, ability to tell the truth, unquote, is closely related to the witness's nearness, both geographically and chronologically, to the events recorded. The New Testament accounts of the life and teaching of Jesus were recorded by men who had been either eyewitnesses themselves or who related the accounts of eyewitnesses of the actual events or teachings of Christ. Uh, let me pause there. Brother? Yeah, uh, I, I, uh, I'm taken back to, to Aristotle and uh, the, the first quote you made. It, it, what he did is he said that historical, doc the documents are supposed to be self-supporting. In other words, if there's no ulterior or counter to what's written, you accept what's written as fact or historical accuracy. So uh, a document that's self-supporting, let's say that there's, uh, the Iliad's a, a, an, an exception. Most documentation from historical or ancient uh, literature, let's say Egyptian, uh, you have a document Therefore, it's self-supporting, and unless contrary, unless contraindicated, it is written, it is so. And what's great about Scripture and the 20,000, I believe you said, uh, different manuscripts uh, that have been located and examined is the lack of contraindication within Scripture. Uh, there's... You know, you, you talk to an atheist or, or an agnostic or someone who uh, wants to denigrate scripture, they they jump on, uh, you know, in one gospel it said there were two people there, and one gospel it said there were three people there for whatever event. And they, they hammer that like it's an aha moment. Well, if there's two people there, it's possible that there are three people, and they just mention two of them. You know, there's nothing contraindicating in scripture. And it's amazing. How is that possible within the original manuscript? And then you've got 20,000 different sources from different writers, from different lo geographical locations, and still no contraindications. And, uh, and the, the historical uh, template for accepting uh, a historical document as fact is, is it self-supporting? If it's written and there's nothing to contraindicate it, it is written, it is so. And yet the Bible uh, or scripture uh, is thrown outside that circle. And if it's written, let's find a reason that it's not so. Yeah, it's, I, I think that uh, this Aristotle's dictum, as he, as he calls it, it, it's worth repeating. Uh, and it is, read it again, it says, quote, the benefit of the doubt is to be given to the document itself and not er arrogated 
by the critic to himself, unquote. I'm not sure what arrogated means, but uh, I'm this victim. Go ahead, brother. Were you going to? It, mean, it, it means questioned by opinion. Okay. Uh, but so what we, we get from Aristotle and a lot of people who do not respect the apostles, they do not respect the Bible, but they're, they're, most people are quick to respect Aristotle. <laughs> so if you have placed any value in his, his uh, philosophy, his writings, teachings, then listen to this. The benefit of the doubt is to be given to the document itself and not irrigated by the critic to himself. Um, now, I'll continue reading on. Uh, it says, Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, quote, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, have handed them down to us, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, unquote. Uh, that's Luke, uh, who wrote the book of Luke, who we discussed earlier, uh, is, 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 should be considered as the, a, a historian of the highest level uh, for the work he did in, in recording all this history. And uh, you can see that his, uh, he's saying, I'll read it again before then you can um, speak about it, but I think you get his, his intentions from this. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, and the word is, uh, that, that word there is capitalized. And we've done some studies on this recently also or that you might find interesting about this, this term, the word and the title, the word. Uh, in this case, it's capitalized. So that, that is an, another name for Jesus. So let me read and keep that in mind. Who were eyewitnesses and servants, servants, of the word or Jesus have handed them down to us. It seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order. Most excellent Theophilus. Brother Joe? Well, the reason Luke is, is so highly regarded, even among secular uh, uh, historians is because Unlike the other Gospels, uh, where it was uh, uh, everything was firsthand accounting, Luke uh, not only did firsthand accounting, but he did he researched facts through a multiplicity of other firsthand accounts, and so he brought everything together in a way that uh, even the the people that day and the and honest historians of this day really can't question much, and so. Uh, while people may question the authenticity of a lot of scripture, you'd be hard pressed to find uh, even a modern historian who doesn't have a great deal of respect for Luke. All right, well, just some key words again. I read it twice, but he says, it's an account of the things accomplished among us uh, from the beginning, uh, based on eyewitnesses of the servants of Jesus, that was has been handed down and so he said he's done careful investigation about everything from the beginning and now he's writing it out for, for the record and this is a letter uh, the book of acts is a letter that uh most people don't think of the book uh, of the, uh, the book of acts as a as a letter as a what the letters that are in the New Testament, these, these are called epistles, not to be confused with apostles. <laughs> but uh, the epistles, we think of uh, uh, Paul's letters. Uh, there, people think there's 12. I, I believe Hebrews is uh, also Paul's writing, so I, I'd say 13. And, and, and then we've got the epistles or letters of, from Peter and from John, 
and I guess uh, Jude I might be forgetting somebody, but these are all letters that were written, and uh, that a lot, a lot of times people aren't aware that they, these are actually letters. Uh, but the Book of Acts is a letter too that that Luke wrote to Theosop, what is it, Theophilus, and he wrote down this historical account and he sent it in the form of a letter to this Theophilus. Yeah, that, that escaped me, Luke. I didn't know that. Uh, I, I, uh, I, well, maybe I did know it and I've forgotten it. But uh, yeah, that's an interesting uh, uh, factoid there. Uh, it, it reads like such a historical account. I, I didn't realize, I thought you know, it was being written to the world, but I guess it was being written to an individual, and, and that escaped me. Yeah, okay, uh, I'll keep reading then. It says, 2 Peter 1, verse 16, quote, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales, but we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, unquote. I think that's uh, deserve a, a comment on that alone, brother. Yeah, we, we were eyewitnesses. Uh, this, is, this is not just uh, an eyewitness account. This is an eyewitness account uh, who has gone to the trouble of uh, uh, researching in historical method uh, other eyewitnesses to the same accounts. And, and uh, including them in a, in a very uh, understandable and, and verifiable way. Again, Luke's very respected amongst everybody, even, even those who would uh, question the authenticity of Scripture. You still there, Luke, or is my connection fading here? Oh, boy. I, I, I said such profound things, and I was muted. <laughs> uh, that was actually Second Peter there. So Peter's talking about how he and these others were eyewitnesses. Uh, but in the book of Acts that uh, Luke wrote, uh, oftentimes uh, when he's writing the book, he, he actually uses the word we because he was a companion to Paul, and he was actually there. Uh, he's not just getting it information from Paul and from uh, uh, other apostles and eyewitnesses, but he's actually says we oftentimes because he was there as a witness himself. In 1 John 1 3, it says, quote, What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So, John saying, we have seen uh, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. Another declaration from, from John that, you know, I, I saw it. We saw it ourselves and just were eyewitnesses. And John 19.35 says, quote, and he who has seen has borne witness and his witness is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you also may believe. Uh, this is John writing when he says, and he who has seen, he's, he's re referencing himself. He does that oftentimes in the book of John. He talks about himself like, you know, it's another person sometimes, you know, it's interesting style. Uh, let me get your thoughts before I continue reading here. Yeah, that, that style uh, is, is part of uh, an evidence that, that we as Christians, Christians, believe that uh, Scripture was God-breathed, and uh, we believe that uh, he used uh, people uh, through their own experiences, but he directed their words and uh, directed what uh, they would record regarding what they saw and, uh, and what they witnessed. And so uh, there's a there's a divine aspect to the we, I believe. All right, now Luke, this is Luke three, verse one. Quote: Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Itureia and 
Trachonitis, and Lysanias was Tetrarch of Abilene, unquote. Uh, this is particularly interesting because you've got so much detail, and this is one of the reasons that Luke is so respected, because um, he's, he's um, supporting everything he's saying by giving you all these historical facts that are verifiable, that you can check all this out and see these are real people who really had these, these, uh, these governmental positions at that time. Brother? Uh, it, you know, that's, what I, that's, that's just what I was writing down, Luke. As you were speaking, I, the notes I took was a, was a one sentence note, such historic detail. If, if you look at uh, any other religious book, uh, like Mormonism or whatever, uh, the detail is, is uh, fantasical. And uh, if you look at uh, the tales of uh, Homer, they're, they're epic and based in, in uh, some reality and some historical detail, like the Trojan Wars. But uh, they're largely uh, fantasyful also, and there's no way to, to uh, uh, verify a lot of the facts that people assume within the text. The Bible's absolutely, it stands alone insofar as that the details that are given. Uh, you'd have to be a fool to try to write uh, something that wasn't true and give so many details. You know, uh, you got to remember your lies if you're going to be a liar. You've heard that. Well, here we have a whole group of people spread all over uh, uh, the world there that have all written about the same things, and yet the details match perfectly. And every year we discover more and more uh, uh, extra biblical uh, evidence that was what was written in the Bible is absolutely true, such as the Roman leaders of the time. And, and uh, the people, even the even the regional leaders, he's giving uh, detail of. It's really amazing. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting point you make that if if if, uh, if someone has the intention of lying or deceiving us, um, if they're good at it, uh, they're going to be very careful to not give too many specifics. Uh, they want to speak in broad generalities because if they're really a good deceiver, they, they realize that uh, every detail is another way that they can stumble if they have to repeat it. So they try to keep it broad and general, and uh, the specifics of the Bible are just give us more confidence in it. And more than that, there's a multiplier. There's a multiplier effect here, Luke. Because uh, Luke was just one of the uh, authors. We have a whole group of authors uh, that were separated uh, all over the place at that time. And the books were written uh, between uh, 40 and, and uh, 90 AD or whatever. And they were all scattered with different geographical locations. It's well, I think it's well documented that John was on the Isle of Patmos. All these people, they couldn't get together and say, let's get our story right. <laughs> it just, it wasn't an option. These letters were saved by the Galatians, saved by the Ephesians, gathered together uh, at a later date, put together. And guess what? When they're all put together, all these different guys from different areas and different uh, times uh, over that span match up perfectly. Uh, it's it really, there's indisputable uh, authenticity. Yeah, and I, uh, oftentimes um, uh, uh, people like Josh McDowell and uh, what's the other author I mentioned in the first study, uh, Lee Strobel and many others throughout history, their, their intention was to f find some mistakes in the Bible, some something that's historically incorrect or geographically incorrect or something. And they, they de dedicate their lives to try to find some mistakes so they can say, aha. And occasionally they find something. And then 50 years later, an archaeologist digs, it, digs up something and, and discovers, wait, the city did exist. Here it is. Here's proof of it. So uh, uh, over time, we, we just get more and more um, proof that uh, there, there are no mistakes. There are no inaccuracies. 
kind of funny how it's, it's very funny that they have yet to find anything that disproves anything. And that in itself is huge. All right. So, uh, and what about this tetrarch of Abilene? It's interesting, some of the names, uh, Abilene. Don't we have an Abilene? Abilene. Texas. Texas. Abilene, Texas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, this closeness to the recorded accounts is an extremely effective means of certifying the accuracy of what is retained by a witness. The historian, however, also has to deal with the eyewitness who uh, cons consciously or unconsciously tells falsehoods, even though he is near to the event and is competent to tell the truth. The, the New Testament accounts of Christ were being circulated within the lifetimes of those alive at the time of his life. These people could certainly confirm or deny the accuracy of the accounts. In advocating their case for the gospel, the apostles had appealed, even when confronting their most severe opponents, to common knowledge concerning Jesus. They not only said, quote, look, we saw this, unquote, or, quote, we heard that, unquote, but they turned the tables around and right in front of adverse critics, they said, quote, you also know about these things. You saw them. You yourselves know about it, unquote. One had better be careful when he says to his opposition, quote, you know this also, unquote. Because if he isn't right in the details, it will be shoved right back down his throat. What, what comes to mind, Luke, is, is uh, Stephen's last message to those who uh, would kill him. And uh, if, if you haven't had a chance to, to read that bit of history, uh, please take the time. It's bloody amazing. And, uh, yeah, and it's so many times uh, that, uh, that there would be reason and, and, uh, and uh, the ability to disprove what was being said in the Bible, and yet nobody has, nobody did. All right. Um, Acts 2, verse 22, quote, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, unquote. Another example of this point that he's saying, not only am I claiming this, but you're very much aware of it. You've seen it for yourself. Acts 26 verse 24 through 28 says, quote, And while Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth, for the king knows about these matters. And I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice, for this has not been done in a corner, unquote. <laughs> I've always loved that uh, the conversation there when Fe Festus says Paul's lo lost his mind because of learning so much. It is kind of hilarious, isn't it? Hey, and... <clears throat> There's, there's so much authenticity to, to the conversation. Uh, it it, it kind of, this that's beyond fiction, you know? That, that's, uh, you can kind of kind of hear it and feel it. So, but, but again, Paul is, is saying to this king, Festus, he says, you and the other kings, they, 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 you're, I'm not telling you anything that you're not aware of. It's not like you don't know what's going on in your kingdom. You've, I'm sure you've, you've, you're very much aware of all these things yourself. So um, 
that would, as he said earlier, that would backfire on you if, if you're making that kind of a statement. He said, well, wait a second. I, I don't know anything about that. Uh, yeah, works of Christ were common knowledge throughout Israel. Nobody didn't know about all that. I mean, he was the talk at the time. That's why they had to dispatch with him. Yeah. All right, now uh, I'll continue. It says, concerning the primary source value of the New Testament records, F.F. F. Bruce Rylands, professor of biblical criticism and exegesis at the University of Manchester says, quote, and it was not only friendly eyewitnesses that the early preachers had to reckon with. There were others less well disposed who were also conversant with the main facts of the ministry and death of Jesus. The disciples could not afford to risk inaccuracies, uh, not to speak of willful manipulation of the facts, uh, which would at once be exposed by those who would be only too glad to do so. On the contrary, one of the strong points in the original apostolic preaching is the confident appeal to the knowledge of the hearers. They, they not only said, quote, we are witnesses of these things, but also as you yourselves also know, had there been any tendency to depart from the facts in any material respect, the possible presence of hostile witnesses in the audience would have served as a further corrective. Comes to my mind is in Acts, I mean, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, uh, 1 through through 4, or maybe 1 through 8, that uh, there, there's also an appeal to the, the, that same thing that says, and there's many, many here, many eyewitnesses that uh, uh, maybe might have to read the whole thing to get it exactly right. But there's also this same kind of a statement that uh, uh, the, the resurrection happened. And these are eyewitnesses and many of them, they're all still alive. It's not, you know, there are people alive you can go talk to. They saw him. Yeah, I, I think one of the one of the uh, beautiful things about Scripture, we as believers understand anyway, that uh, if it's in Scripture, uh, when they spoke, God gave them utterance. It wasn't like they had to recall on their own frail recollection. Uh, uh, God was was directing their words, I believe, uh, as as proved uh, by it being recorded in Holy Scripture. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we say the scriptures, the Bible is the word of God, and it's God breathed, and uh, it's inspired by God. But we've also noted that uh, the, the personality of each writer, as it's written, is the, there's this also, that is a, uh, an aspect of the scriptures. We, we see the different styles of writing and um, different perspectives. Uh, that's why you have these, the, the phrase, the gospel according to, to, to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark. It's not that there's a different different event, different, uh, that there's, they're disagreeing. It's just that it gets told from their perspective and, and, and you know, from what they saw, from what they, they've learned. Uh, but so that's a factor. And, and, and then the, 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 the style of writing uh, is is a factor, but God is the one that is inspiring them to say, but there's still some kind of freedom there f for vocabulary and for uh, style. And I've, I've always found and, that very interesting. Yeah, I do too. And, and from a perspective of people that say, you know, Christianity is an exercise in blind faith, uh, scripture puts an emphasis on, uh, on a, a multitude of witnesses. And uh, so hardly uh, something God uh, wants us to have blind faith in <clears throat> because he supplied us with a multitude of witnesses. And uh, so uh, that's just further proof that blind faith is not blind at all. It's evidenced. 
All right. Now, going on, it says Lawrence J. McGinley of St. Peter's College comments on the value of hostile witnesses in relationship to recorded events. Quote, first of all, eyewitnesses of the events in question were still alive when the tradition had been completely formed. And among those eyewitnesses were bitter enemies of the new religious movement. <clears throat> Yet the tradition claimed to narrate a series of well-known deeds and publicly taught doctrines at a time when false statements could and would be challenged." Unquote. Yeah, like I said, you know, Israel, all Israel, and and a, a, a large portion of the the Roman community uh, were well aware of all these things that took place uh, while Christ uh, had his ministry for those three and a half years, and they had every incentive to attack the veracity of anything any of the apostles said afterwards to disprove the resurrection or to put a chink in the armor that uh, uh, they wore because it was spreading to the to the people of Israel their very power structure was in danger and they had great motivation to do anything or say anything to uh, uh, make the people uh, question what the apostles said and recorded Yeah, if, if anybody did have a bad motive and wanted to either deceive uh, or uh, invent things, and, uh, misrepresent anything, uh, it would be a very risky thing to do because there were so many other eyewitnesses that would either corroborate or dispute what they said. Um, so I'll continue reading. It says, New Testament scholar Robert Grant of the University of Chicago concludes, quote, <clears throat> at the time they, the synop that is the synoptic gospels were written uh, or, or maybe supposed to have been written, uh, there were eyewitnesses and their testimony was not completely disregarded. This means that the gospels must be regarded as largely reliable witnesses to the life death and resurrection of Jesus, unquote. Will Durant, who was trained in the discipline of historical investigation and spent his life analyzing records of antiquity, writes, quote, despite the prejudices and theological pre, uh, preconceptions of the evangelists, uh, they record many incidents that mere inventors uh, would have concealed. Uh, the co competition of the apostles for high places in the kingdom, their flight after Jesus' arrest, Peter's denial, the failure of Christ to work miracles in Galilee, the references of some auditors to his possible insanity, his his early uncertainty as to his mission, his confessions of ignorance as to the future, his moments of bitterness, his despairing cry on the cross. No one reading these scenes can doubt the reality of the figure behind them, that a few simple men should in one generation have invented so powerful and appealing a personality so lofty an ethic and so inspiring a vision of human brotherhood would be a miracle far more incredible than any recorded in the gospels after two centuries of higher criticism the outlines of the life character and teaching of christ remain reasonably clear and constitute the most fascinating feature in the history of western man Yes. All right. Hey. We're, you're back? Yep. Okay. Brother Joe? Yeah, it's, it's another cooperation of Scripture. Uh, God decided and, and, and compelled the writers to include 
uh, instances of uh, frailty uh, include things that uh, someone who sought to deceive would never include. Uh, David, for instance, in the Old Testament, uh, David's uh, murderous intent towards one of his own. Uh, Christ uh, 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 crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? At that moment, it would have been considered uh, uh, something of a, a negative. Uh, but as you look at the scripture overall, it, it God had it included uh, in order to show honest and integral uh, uh, authenticity of the scriptures. Yeah, that, that was a very profound paragraph that we, we just read there to me. I, it's always been something that I found very, very uh, compelling that uh, if it was the intention uh, for people to make up stories and just to deceive us all for some ulterior motive, um, why would they, they paint themselves in such a bad light in so many ways? Why wouldn't they try to con either conceal these bad things like Peter's denials? Uh, or uh, either conceal them uh, or uh, you know, um, the need to put them in there or the, it, 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 and paint themselves and to actually uh, not paint themselves, but uh, reveal their, their faults, their character failings. And um, someone who is, you know, just wants to make up things and, uh, and deceive people, they, I think that they would uh, only paint a very rosy picture instead of revealing all of these faults and even some of these uh, apparent uh, weaknesses of Jesus and failings of Jesus. And for example, as it's cited here, this inability to perform miracles in Galilee. I mean, it seems to me people would not put those things in, the, in their, their letters, in their gospel accounts. Uh, if, if their purpose was just to tell a story to, to uh, deceive everybody. Yeah, I, I'm thinking of what you just read regarding uh, Paul's address uh, and the conversation with, with Festus. Uh, later on, Paul goes on to reveal that, that uh, he can't control his flesh, and he flagellated himself. He's been called mad. And that had to have been uh, more than just Festus, who was, who was trying to put that rumor into the air. And yet he tells us of his failings after instructing people on the way they should live. Uh, that's, to me, powerful evidence. Yeah, okay, so uh, I believe we have enough time to do this final point, an external evidence test. And... It says the, the third test of historicity is that of external evidence. The issue here is whether other historical material confirms or denies the internal testimony of the documents themselves. In other words, what sources are there apart from the literature under analysis that substantiate or, uh, you know, its accuracy, reliability, and authenticity? Gottschalk argues that, quote, conformity or agreement with other known historical or scientific facts is often the decisive test of evidence, whether of one or more witnesses, unquote. Two friends of the Apostle John confirm the internal evidence from John's account. The historian Eusebius preserves writings of Papias Bishop of Hierapolis, uh, AD 130, quote, the elder, the apostle John, used to say this also, quote, Mark, having been the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately all that he, Peter, mentioned, whether sayings or doings of Christ, not, however, in order for he was neither a hearer nor a companion of the Lord, but afterwards, as I said, he accompanied Peter, who adapted his teachings as necessity required, not as though he were making a compilation of the sayings of the Lord. 
So when Mark made no mistake writing down in this way some things as he mentioned them, for he paid attention to this one thing, not to omit anything that he had heard, not to include any false statement among them. That's, what, that's very, very interesting from Eusebius. And that, that confirms what, what I said very, at the very beginning of this study today is that uh, uh, Mark was not an eyewitness. It, you, some people consider the book of Mark to be the actual gospel of Peter because he got his information from from Peter. And that's it's so that just confirms my client earlier claim, brother. Yeah, there's we went over a little bit of this uh, already, but there's just a, a mountain of uh, confirming evidences uh, for uh, biblical uh, uh, authenticity and reliability, uh, archaeological stuff that we find all the time. One of the things that just came to mind, and I hope it's not off topic, is uh, the writings of John. Uh, people that uh, would say that uh, they are not divinely inspired or historically accurate need no need look no further than today's headlines: uh, the re the restored state of Israel, the the alignment of nations uh, today against Israel. Uh, there's about 60 or 70 uh, individual prophecies that, that uh, John gave uh, that would, without a doubt, be, there's no way to contraindicate them. Uh, Israel being spread throughout the earth, yet maintaining its language and culture, and Israel being restored in a day, all these things go to confirm and evidence uh, uh, at least that the, that author's writings in the New Testament uh, today. Hmm. All right. Um, uh, now, Irenaeus. Now, some people call it um, Irenaeus whether it's Irenaeus or Irenaeus, uh, Bishop of Lyons, A.D. 180. Uh, Irenaeus was a student of Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, who had been a Christian for 86 years and was a disciple of John the Apostle, wrote, quote, Matthew published his gospel among the Hebrews, uh, such as Jews, in their own tongue. Uh, when Peter and Paul were preaching the gospel in Rome and founding the church there, after their departure, uh, such as the, the death which strong tradition places at the time of the Neronian persecution in 64, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, himself handed down to us in writing the substance of Peter's preaching. Luke, the follower of Paul, set down in a book the gospel preached by his teacher. Then John, the disciple of the Lord, who also learned on his breast, this is a reference to John 13, 25 and 21, 20, himself produced his gospel while he was living at Ephesus in Asia. This whole portion here is Kind of what I the point I would made at the very beginning of the study here, um, but that's that's uh, from Irenaeus wrote that, right, brother? Yeah, I, I have nothing to add here, Luke. Okay, we'll continue then. It says archaeology often provides powerful external evidence. It contributes to biblical criticism, not in the area of inspiration and revelation but by providing evidence of accuracy about events that are recorded. Archaeologist Joseph Free writes, quote, archaeology has confirmed countless passages which have been rejected by critics as unhistorical or contradictory to known facts, unquote. We have already seen how archaeology caused Sir William Ramsey to change his initial negative convictions about the historicity of Luke and come to the conclusion that the book of Acts was accurate and its description of the geography 
Antiquities and Society of Asia Minor. F. F. Bruce notes that, quote, where Luke has been suspected of inaccuracy and accuracy has been vindicated by some inscriptional external evidence, it may be legitimate to say that archaeology has confirmed the New Testament record, unquote. Yeah, so, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is, uh, is uh, Nero uh, from, from uh, the time uh, when Christians were being uh, so persecuted and there's a, a, a mountain of, uh, of recognized historical uh, recordings that, that uh, he uh, accused Christians of things that were within scripture and uh, and uh, confirms Christ and and uh, the apostles and so much of Christian uh, thought uh, through his persecutions. Well, we're we're, we're only going to skim the surface, but but uh, if a person goes from this book to the much larger book that we pointed out earlier, the evidence that demands a verdict, and thank you for posting the link to his audio of that. I've got that saved. I'll be watching that probably over the next few days. Uh, and also his other book, uh, More Evidence That Demands a Verdict. This is, this is like equivalent to a book that's like, uh, you, know, you know, three or four inches thick that takes this book and expands, you know, a hundred times. Uh, there, there's, we're only just, hope, uh, hopefully we're stimulating your interest in all this. And if you you do get more interested, you can study this further and find out that there's just a mountain of evidence, many examples of archaeology discovering things that support the Bible. Archaeology, the, these discoveries, none of it it ever disputes it; it only supports it. And anytime someone has uh, charged uh, an error in the Bible, uh, archaeology later on instead of supporting proving the error to be it, there to be an error the archaeology says no there's no error at all it, the bible was right all along and there's many many examples of that all right so i'll, I'll continue reading as a n sherwin white a classical historian writes that quote for acts uh the confirmation of historic historicity is overwhelming unquote he continues by saying that, quote, any attempt to reject its basic historicity, even in matters of detail, must now appear absurd. Roman historians have long taken it for granted, unquote. After personally trying to shatter the historicity and validity of the scriptures, I have come to the conclusion that they are historical trust, historically trustworthy. This is uh, the, the author of this book. Josh McDowell, that's, that's a statement from him. Remember, he started out on a quest to disprove the Bible. And as so many people throughout history have attempted to do that, they realize the folly and end up believing. And so he says here, after personally trying to shatter the historicity and validity of the scriptures, I have come to the conclusion that they are historically trustworthy. If a person discards the Bible as unreliable in this sense, then he or she must discard almost all the literature of antiquity. One problem I constantly face is the, is the desire on the part of many to apply one standard or test to secular literature and another to the Bible. We need to apply the same test whether the literature under investigation is secular or religious. Having done this, I believe we can say, quote, the Bible is trustworthy and historically reliable in its witness about Jesus, unquote. Uh, Dr. Clark H. Pinnock, professor of systematic theology at Regent College states, quote, there exists no document from the ancient world witnessed by so excellent a set of textual and historical testimonies and offering so superb an array of historical data on which an intelligent decision may be made. An honest person cannot dismiss a source of this kind. Skepticism regarding the historical credentials of Christianity is based upon 
and irrational anti-supernatural bias, unquote. And that's the end of this uh, chapter four. So uh, respond to that, please, brother. Yeah, uh, one of the things that, I, you know, we don't normally have a whole lot of time, if any, to prepare for, for these, uh, these hangouts, and we're kind of just grabbing the book and shooting from the hip whatever our, our memory uh, is, and not a lot of prep time at all. But this one came to mind. Uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, a, a great Christian theologian, who uh, was at Oxford with J.R. Tolkien, uh, and was one of the one of the ones who set out to disprove the Bible. Here's one of the little factoids, and there's a million of these, but this is the one that came to mind. So I looked it up real quick while you were talking. And in 1928, 1928, uh, they. Paul mentions a guy named uh, Ariatus, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's in Romans 6, uh, 16, 23, and also in Acts 19, 22. Paul names this guy, and he says he's the city treasurer for, Cor uh, for Corinth. And talk about detail. Uh, he, here Paul twice names the man who was a co-worker with Paul. He was a believer, but he names him as being a city treasurer in the in the city of, of, of Corinth <clears throat> in 1928 while excavating a Corinthian theater uh, they discovered an, an inscription that reads Ariatus in return for his edelship laid uh, the pavement at his own expense this pavement was laid in 50 AD the designation of treasurer describes the work of the Corinthian uh, <laughs> you know, it hardly seems that Paul uh, was going to make something up. And I mean, this was no grand deception. Uh, they, they're finding evidence in 1928 that a, a city treasurer was who Paul said he was. How someone can look at that and say the Bible is fiction is absolutely beyond me and, and beyond C.S. Lewis. Hmm. All right, well, I really enjoyed this chapter four, and I, I think that uh, I, I, I'm just hoping that somebody who is not already a Christian as we are, who, who's not already studied this and, and accepted all this is true, um, if, you're, if you're just either came across this uh, accidentally or if you're, it's a subject that you're you're interested in learning about, and I, I hope you, if if you will, approach this with an open mind. I, I hope that you're seeing that um, our belief in the Bible is not just based on blind faith. And there there is a, a mountain of evidence, uh, historical, archaeological, even scientific, that all supports our our faith that the Bible is truthful, historical, accurate, reliable. And uh, I hope you're beginning to, to see that now. Uh, Brother Joe, give me any closing thoughts here, and then I'll give a little brief gospel message for everybody. Well, my closing thoughts are, uh, what, what, I, what is uh, going through my mind is how much I enjoy our fellowship. Uh, we both have a, a passion for the truth, and it's not that we're nuts for archaeology and, and uh uh, super interested in in uh, history, it's the truth of the Bible, and and that goes beyond historicity and archaeology and all of this detail. It's the very word of God, God breathed, that is absolute foundational truth given by God to men, and that's our passion. It is is truth. And so uh, I'm just, I, I, if nobody watches this, I just want to tell you how much I enjoy sitting here and, and uh, discussing our passion for God and truth. Uh, thank you, brother. I, I, I agree. And uh, uh, that, that brings to the point that the in, intentions, the, the motivation for even doing these hangouts, um, I, it, it's not my goal to try to be popular and famous on, on YouTube. It's my goal to have fellowship 
with other believers to study together, to teach what we believe to be true and, and, uh, and leave uh, uh, something for posterity so that these, uh, these teachings, uh, hopefully over the period, if, if not in one day or one week or one month, over the period of years, maybe decades, these things will continue to help people and, and have confidence in, in uh, the scriptures and faith in Jesus. Uh, some of my videos, they get um, a lot of views immediately, and some of them, they get uh, a lot of views over a period of several years. So um, that's not my main concern. I just, uh, as you said, the fellowship, the chance to study and learn together and share this, and hopefully somebody uh, watching will, will, will benefit from it. Let me take just a moment here and kind of tell you the most important thing that you'll find in the entire Bible. It's called the gospel. It's a Greek word. It means good news. And the good news, if I was going to say it as succinctly as I could, is that um, Jesus offers you eternal life in the new heavens and new earth that he promises. And he offers you gift, and, and you receive it um, simply by faith in Jesus Christ, believing that he alone has the ability to give it to you and that he, in fact, does give it to you at the moment you trust him. And, and, that, uh, and that's the gospel. Now, the, the, the details about uh, who he is and what he's done and why this is possible, it, it would be helpful for you to understand. And, and the details are that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. Uh, Jesus came down from heaven and became a man, uh, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, he did it in order to die for our sins, and he did. He suffered and died on a cross, and that death on the cross served as a full payment for the sins of all mankind. All of your sins and my sins are completely paid for because of what Jesus did for us. Everybody say, thank you, Jesus. Our sins are paid for, and we owe it to him. And, uh, and he, he raised himself from the dead on the third day. Yes? I know I'll be there in about two minutes. Jesus died on that cross. He was buried. But on the third day, he raised himself back to life bodily. And he walked for 40 days among 500 witnesses. Uh, bodily resurrection proving that he has power over life and death. And he is eternal God Almighty. And, and that gives us confidence that our faith in him is justified. So if you will put your faith in Jesus, who he is and what he's done for you, believe you're going to go to heaven because of your faith in Jesus. If you do that, you're assured, you're guaranteed, you will go to heaven. I hope you do that now. Um, Brother Joe, thanks. Uh, thanks again. And um, I promised my wife I was going to take her to see Tarzan today. So I'm going to rush off. I won't be able to visit any anymore. But uh to the viewers, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, Joe and Ted, thank you for participating. And uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.